you will you will do better with your team which you know to me like my teammate on a wedding day is the photographer the most creative thing that i do on a wedding day <laughs> isn't like my photography or whatever. The most creative thing I do is problem solve whatever the hell is gonna happen. And so there's been times where I've gone out and for 45 minutes I've served food. Anything that I can do to just work better with everybody else is gonna be a net positive for everyone. Uh, I think that we, because we are our own businesses and we are our own like silo, sometimes that part can kind of like show up on the wedding day and be less collaborative mm. and more like butting heads like we're almost competition. Hey everybody, welcome to the Wedding Film School show. My name is Jared and as usual I have Jason McCutcheon on the show. Jason, welcome to my show today. Oh yeah, glad to have you. I got the large coffee for this show. <laughs> Good. So, so um, we're having a long day today. We're actually this this is number two of three podcasts. Yeah, this is a marathon day for marathon sure. Day. You told me about it, and I was like, Ugh, I'm gonna it's going to be exhausted. fun. It is fun. We're having a great time. We're grinding out, being Lo creators. Lots of coffee today. Uh, lots of uh, yeah, rest in between breaks. But we're we're doing it. Yeah, so. we're doing it. We're doing it. I mean, we're actually in the middle of how many how many cannon bodies are we selling? <laughs> We're about to sell 12 Canon bodies, so if you know anybody who wants a 5D Mark IV or Mark III, <laughs> reach out. With, uh, it only has, like, how many shutter counts? Yeah, so I just pulled up shutter counter, and it's, like, 9,000, 10,000 shutter counts on all of them because we've just used them for video for the last six years. Yeah, it's funny. It's like a lot of videographer, photographers, they do, like, 2,000 shutters in a day at a wedding, and we're doing 9,000 in six years. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, hey, um, before we get into the show today, we got an awesome guest, but I'm going to say today's show is brought to you by the YOLO box. It's a wonderful little device, a switcher, a streamer, 4G. It's got Ethernet, two HDMI inputs, and honestly, really, really cool device. If you're looking to get into live streaming, I always say, um, my opinion, if you're a wedding filmmaker, um, the easiest way to get into live streaming is the YOLO box by YOLO Live. Um, there is a link in the description on the YouTube page if you're listening um, on the podcast. We appreciate it if you use that link because it helps support our show. So head over there if you would like a Yola box. And can I just say about the Yola box? Um, because I w we bought all this stuff last year. As soon as COVID happened, we were like, how do we figure out how to do live streaming? Like, it's a scary thing. Like, it's something we talked about doing and we always avoided because we were terrified of it. And when we got the Yola box, I was like, wow, this is way easier than easy. what we put together like this whole big rig and then it was so easy that we actually got people who aren't even really videographers to be like hey stand here live stream this i'm gonna operate the camera touch the button switch back and forth direct this way and literally taught other people who aren't even videographers how to operate the yola box so very easy it's not intimidating get one and see for yourself yeah i would never by the way with live streaming just I guess one camera, maybe leave it. Um, you might be able to leave it unmanned. But, you know, but literally, like, you can get an assistant to operate this thing. It's that easy. So, mm -hmm. so anyway, that's who's bringing us the show today. And it's a device we use. Like always, we say we don't like to rep things we don't actually use. And this is something we use. But anyway, let's get into today's show. Uh, today's show, we got a friend of the show, somebody who we really love and who does awesome work. Binge Heish. How you doing, buddy? Hey, hey. Stoked to be here. Thanks. Benj, we um, pretty much talk about you in some way, shape, or form. We've managed to squeeze you into almost every episode so far. So it's a, it's a pleasure to it's finally. It's been on so many clubhouses. I appreciate that. Actually have you I was on. actually listening. I was listening to an episode, watching slash listening the other day, and about like 48 minutes in, I just like perked up and heard my name. It's like, wait, <laughs> what? what the heck? Yeah. So yeah. But it's, it's always fun to be mentioned in things, you know? Total. Well, it's like we're always talking and, and – interesting things are really happening in the wedding film world right now um, with elopement videography, which isn't really something that was common. Even like two, three years ago, you had probably had people on the outskirts doing it. In the last year after COVID, it's just blown up. Like I see people just yeah. doing awesome looking stuff. And so naturally we're like, oh yeah, when Benj kind of introduced that to mm -hmm. the photography market, you know, years and years ago, um, we're kind of seeing uh, I don't know, like we're some just, sort of we're, revolution we're now with video. We're way behind on that as videographers. Like we are. I, 
I mean, I'm not sure how many of these people actually do elopements, but literally every person in Clubhouse is an elopement photographer. <laughs> Oh my gosh, <laughs> it's true. You look at sometimes I'll be in a room and it'll have anything to do with elopements, and you'll look, you'll just kind of scroll through, and every single profile picture is identical because yes. they all are like that, like you know, cool, like brownish tone, kind of like this stuff, and then everyone has like a hipster hat on, <laughs> just yeah. in golden light, you know, and everyone's a inwards into elopements. But now it makes a lot of sense yes. because of COVID and everything like that. Um, and I will say too, you guys are East Coast, like I'm West Coast, so that whole thing was a little bit more. We like sort of pioneered it out here, and it's finally making it, it its way back to you guys, you know. Yep. Boston every single year is ranked least trendy, least stylish city in the U.S. So we we're used to you know being the tail end of every single trend. <laughs> Very sensible though. Very sensible. Sure. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So Benj, before we get into the topic today, we're gonna to be doing three questions with Benj Heish. You ready to do this? Let's go. The first question, as always, is what is in your kit? Yeah, so um, I, I should have grabbed some, and I'm surprised there's not some by me, but I shoot with Leica cameras, and so I'm a photographer too, for those who don't know. So. Uh, I definitely don't suggest ever trying to. Well, actually, in the new Canon or in the, the new Leica SL2S is a decent video camera. Um, but yeah, I use Leica M10s as my primary like digital body. I have a couple of those, and then just a kind of slew of lenses for that system. Um, and then I also have a Leica M6, which is a film camera, and then like a Hasselblad 500cm that's a medium format film camera. And uh, yeah, I'm just like a big, big nerd when it comes to cameras and, and gear and stuff like that. So I have just cameras everywhere. I have like a YouTube channel where I talk about gear and whatnot. So uh, yeah, I'm all about it. Ben, why don't you explain to us videographers what a rangefinder actually is? Because we use the word because we think it means silver body. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, that's a lot of people think that the Fuji film cameras, they're like, oh, that's a rangefinder. And like, maybe that's how it works. But it's, you know, the camera that has like the offset, you know, focusing thing. But uh, the way a rangefinder works is it, they came out with it in like the 30s or something like that. And Leica has been making the same type of camera with the same lens mount and everything since the mid 50s. And uh, the way it works is there's a small little like piece of glass here and then your viewfinder. And then inside, when you focus the lens, it moves a little thing on the inside. And then you have to have two things that are overlaying in the middle. If you've ever seen like a really old camera, um, sometimes you basically have to overlay two different images to get them to be in focus. And it is like a bizarre thing that makes probably no sense and is a 70 plus year old process. But for some reason, it just like clicked in my brain. Um, and I actually recently did like a YouTube short 30 second video on how to focus a rangefinder too. So if you want to ever look and you can see through like the viewfinder of my camera, you can see how that kind of works in that way. But the way that I shoot with being outdoors and everything like that, um, I just found that that process of, of focusing when my clients are really far away, um, it just, it just works for me for whatever reason. Question number two. Um, tell us about a wedding that has just really inspired you that you've done either recently or anywhere in your career. Uh, I mean, I'm sort of known, I guess, for the whole like adventure elopement trend. Like that, my, it's like what my, me and my clients started that in like 2013. Um, so I've just had a, a ton of those that have been super memorable because it's just so, you know, we talked about it a little bit earlier, but you know, just like me and maybe a videographer and an officiant and a couple and that's it. So, you know, it's, it's climbing up mountains and, and for what's me, the most challenging uh, one that you can remember well i did one in in uh june of this year that was uh like i think uh, i'd have to like check it but it was like a thousand vertical feet per mile and so i'm carrying up just like a bag full of gear because once you got to the top i was thinking like man i want to have everything available so when i get there i you know and then i got to all the way to the top didn't even change lenses anything like that and carried all this gear of <laughs> this like sheer rock face basically for nothing um but it's one of those things where, like if if anybody likes hiking or doing anything like running or any outdoor stuff like when you get there or you get to the end or whatever it makes all that stuff more worth it right that you had to like work to get to something um and that's one of the things i like about doing elopements and whatnot when you hike because like when you get to the end there's like that payoff and that payoff is so much better 
having made the trek up there than if you just like drove somewhere, right? Um, plus, if I I'm getting paid to like walk up a mountain, so that's kind of fun too, I guess. Question number three: How can people get connected with you on the interwebs? Yeah, so I mean, I'm I'm bench heish like everywhere basically. So, uh, you know, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Clubhouse. Now, um, I have a Patreon where if people, for those who don't know what Patreon is, it's like a, a monthly subscription kind of thing, and I I run it as an educational platform. Um, so you can find me there. I do a ton of video tutorials and stuff uh, on there. Um, then I also have presets, which are. Um, pretty widely used in the photo world at least and then uh they've also been converted into LUTs as well so if anybody wants to kind of like look at the presets and everything like that they can also match them to video LUTs which is pretty rad look I'm just gonna be completely honest with you can we be a little bit transparent here I'm gonna tell you one of my deepest darkest secrets I actually really don't enjoy editing that much <laughs> If you were to give me the option between shooting and editing, I would pick shooting 11 times out of 10. And if you've been editing and, and doing video production for any length of time, you know that dread in your heart as you know wedding after wedding after wedding keeps on mounting up, piling up on your backlog. It really sucks. I hate it and I'm sure you do too. So what can you do about it? You can of course ignore it. It's not gonna go away. You can hire a video editor to work on staff. Maybe it costs you 50 to 60 grand plus taxes, or you can simply reach out to our friends at No Backlog. They make it super easy to knock out edits while you focus on other more important things like growing your business and making more money. And that's what it's all about, right? Save time and money by working with a professional, reliable, and affordable video editing partner. And get your life back today. You can spend more time with your kids, with your spouse, with your important other person, or you can simply just play more video games. I don't care. This is a no judgment zone, man. So make sure you're visiting nobacklog.com and get started today. You know, back when we were doing Wedding Pros, like our goal, Benj, was like, we're going to unite the world of creatives. We're going to bring them all into one place. And we quickly realized, um, I don't think the world's ready for that yet, <laughs> but <laughs> but we're it's still like something I care about, and I and I do think like photographers are very valuable in a lot of ways. A, you actually literally make me tons of money. B, um, <laughs> they're valuable in that like they have a perspective in how their art is created that um, oftentimes we don't really have as filmmakers, and so. I always want to have photographers as part of the wedding film school show, um, even though it might not seem like something we naturally have. But I, when I, you're our first photography guest, and so I was like, let's let's have Ben John. He's our first let's photographer go. on wedding film school, and 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 I think it's great because you, make, people might not know this, Ben, but you got your start in wedding videography, right? I did actually, yeah. My well, I got my start in video, and then I forced my brother to do the first wedding that we did together. But I have, I have done video on weddings before. Yes, so, very early on on mini DV tapes. I do not recommend it. <laughs> You're a wedding <laughs> filmmaker, then. I I am actually a little. I don't know if I told you this too, but I I did a, an elopement in June of last year on on video. Wow. Um, just because. Because you know what else was going on? Nothing's going on in COVID land after in June, and uh, a friend, you know, mess wrote in some group, "Hey, is anybody like super low budget?" And I was like, "Yeah, I'll drive to the Oregon coast and go, you know, film a wedding. I have sort of the gear to do it." And the expectations <laughs> were zero, and I know, I feel like I know enough about video a little bit that I could make something out of it. So it was a massive learning experience for sure. So, <laughs> tell me a little bit about what. Like, how was that? I, I'm I'm a little surprised that you would be learning anything from that. So, because like, oh, tell me about what's different. And like, what did you, what was like the, oh, the learning experience? No, I need to like do a, a YouTube video or a Patreon or something like that on it because, you know, and part of my pitch was, you know, she's the 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 couple was like, hey, well, you know, what like, can you show me some of your wedding films? I was like, no, I clearly <laughs> do not have any wedding films. I cannot show you anything. And so I sent her my YouTube videos and I was like, I have a camera that films and it looks okay. Also, I take all of these amazing photos 
And so if you can imagine the fact that like I can make things move in a video form and also I really know what I'm doing in photography, maybe I could put something together. And her budget was like like really, really low. So like no, I wasn't really taking money away from an actual filmmaker or anything. And uh, I did it like with a friend of mine was the photographer and I was just like, hey, like it would be fun to try it out. But the thing is, man, like, because I have so many, I've decade, over a decade of experience of, of working alongside a videographer, but actually being the one to do it is way different. Even though I thought, oh yeah, they can just hang back. Like they just kind of get some B-roll shots here and there. You're basically just making like a three, four minute like music video. No problem. Just get some good, good shots along the way and splice it together. It'll be fine. But man, like when you actually have to get all those shots and then you have to go through and mess with them. And even day of, I'm worried. I'm like, oh shoot, now I have to worry about audio and do this. And then, oh my gosh, it was just way more hectic. Yeah. And even me trying to like remember to like change frame rates and all sorts of stuff. It was just like bonkers, well, way more than I anticipated. You're kind of a perfectionist too. So I imagine like your standards are on the higher side, but like, I do think you point Fair. out, like I was telling Jared, I'm like, this is what I think the difference is. Um, obviously we talked about like, we're not known for our bedside manner as f videographers, but like a lot of that comes down to those, like, you actually have to be so present with your equipment that it's mm. like, until you get good, it's hard to be present with the other people because like, is my battery mm. going out? Yeah. Is my audio there? Is this and all this stuff? And yeah. like ph photographers are very used to like constantly, all they do is collect content all day. Be with people, collect content, be with people, collect content. Yeah. Videographers are like planning, 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 people, content, planning, people, content, planning. Yeah, that's true. And it's like, so like when you have audio and motion and like all these other things where like, if I see a moment happening, I'm like, snap, 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 maybe I'll take four frames, but then you have to like go in there and go, okay, motion, how do I make this? And then you're thinking about the edit at the end going like, how am I going to fit this in and where can I move this? And like, you have all these other things that are happening. I can isolate someone and move and wait for the perfect thing to happen and just click it real quick and go, cool. Like that was my shot. Mm -hmm. But you have to have something that at least has a little bit of buffer space around it to make sense in the product at the end. Yeah. That, and that, then audio, I mean, that's a <laughs> complete other beast in its own right, for sure. I, that's, that's a an great entire other job. That's a great point, Jay, talking about just so many things. I, I really hadn't thought about it that way, actually. Um, when I, you hear so many photographers being like, you know, when I first learned, like getting the camera to just work in my hands, like if you're, if you're in your first year or two, it's like, okay, you know, I'm just figuring out the buttons and, and how to work aperture, that kind of stuff, like quickly, do it fast. You make it a part of your body. I feel like as a videographer, I still am like struggling with making the camera and yeah. the whole process a part of my body. Like yeah, it's, it's still like, there's so many things to think about that it's like the last thing I can finally arrive at is talking to the bride and you groom, getting in with them. So. after 10 years of doing this, I wouldn't ever be hustling to barely get something done. But every, not every wedding, but it's not uncommon that I'm like, shoot, get the light set up. Oh, we're barely going to make the reception. Ah! And you're just like running around and like that never goes away. Yeah. That is the thing. I, I always get an, like, I don't always get annoyed. Sometimes I get annoyed when like the videographer doesn't have the audio set up for a first look or whatever. And then I was the one going like, whoa, we have to like hold up at the ceremony real quick. We have to like fix the, the you know, lapel mic on the groom and stuff like that. And I'm going, as I'm doing, I'm going like, I'm the guy. I'm doing it right now. <laughs> I'm holding the ceremony up from starting because I have to make sure the audio is set. Yep. And given wedding film people, we don't want to be that guy. You can do better. Um, but it legitimately is like a whole other ball of wax. But I think on the other side, like – I look at photographers and like, if I was to pick and it's what frame do I like better? Not just cause they can of course do portraits, which I think is another story. I like the negative, the negative space on a portrait versus a landscape. It's just different. You know, we can only shoot landscape, but that being said, um, when you look at like the way that they think about an image, there's so much more thought put into like a single frame. And I, when I look at photographers, I often think like 
we need to slow down a little and think like a photographer as videographers. Like you were telling me one time something like, ah, this thing that annoy me about framing of videographers. Like what's something that sticks out to you as a photographer when you see like filmmakers work without, and we're, there's no judgment, we know. So you can say whatever. I don't know because like, as we were talking about earlier though, I think that one of the things that you guys have is the motion of things. And so you can make something that like would be distracting or whatever be more interesting than we could. So like that's why I have to be much more intentional about all like everything framed and everything. And I think that it works well. Like videographers should do that. Make sure that things are framed well and like comp composed well and like there aren't distracting elements. But since you have motion, some of that stuff can like refocus your energy and your eyes into where the action is happening, whether it's just someone's face or the dress moving or whatever it might be. Don't you think though that the motion, because I, I think this, Jared, and I don't know if you, I'm, I think you probably would agree, like motion can become a crutch for bad comp. Like a, oh, sure. Basically, like if you don't ever compose it right, you're always composing it in frame you're like almost like just improvising every shot mm -hmm. and it's like i think that's a big mistake a lot of filmmakers make is like they pretty much are like i'm gonna spin around this and i'll probably get a good <laughs> frame in <laughs> like yeah i'm gonna push in i'm gonna pull and like i feel like like having like that painterly approach towards a a frame that you have in your head even if you push into it or pull out or, yeah. or, or do a parallax or whatever motion you're trying to do, I think if you can imagine what is the key frame, like a photographer, yeah. like they're like, this yeah. is my key frame. This is the shot I want. I think we would be better at composition, right? As filmmakers. Yeah. And, and the other thing probably about filmmaking that I think a lot of us fall in this category, I certainly do, is I rely on zooms much more than photographers do where the, most of the time when a photographer is using doing a portrait session it's most likely on a prime and i tend to stay away from primes just because as a videographer i have to like zoom in pop in get certain shots i have to like be looking around and making sure that i'm capturing everything happening so i tend to rely on that too which photographers i think move their feet a lot more than us videographers as far as like getting in there well, <laughs> yeah um, because you guys move your feet because you're you know, there's motion that you're yes. doing. We're moving our feet to like reframe yes. basically. Yes. I will say though, like as you're as you're talking about that, that also reminds me that a lot of people you know shoot with like micro four thirds and cameras that don't have as shallow the depth of field because photographers we're shooting on like those GFX cameras that are crazy shallow depth of field, medium format film cameras, crazy shallow depth of field. Everything's full frame, crazy shallow depth of field, and it would be much more i don't know like beneficial to videographers to learn more about composition and framing and balance i think that's a word that doesn't get tossed in there enough is just the balance and the weight of an image um or like a, a frame or not a frame but like a, a clip <laughs> whatever you want to call that um because if you if you started nailing that as as video then your stuff would like would flow much better through because like I, you know, photographers have our crutches of using really shallow depth of field and all that kind of stuff. Um, and you guys can use your crutch of, of movement and, and, and that kind of thing. But I do think it was when you kind of like step the next level of nailing that balance and that framing and everything like that, that's when it really kind of starts to come together. Um, and in the same way, like I'm sure you guys watch films that you love and you look at the framing and the lighting and everything like that. Um, I do the same thing though. I go to like film grab or whatever that website is dot com and just look at still frames of cinematic images and watch how they're composed and how they're balanced and, and all that kind of stuff. And I do feel like that is something that both photographers and videographers don't do well enough in general. Totally sure. agree. Well, totally agree. Those guys that when you're doing pre-production for any cinematic or a lot of commercial yeah. work, you're planning your shots ahead of time. And, and so like you're actually taking a photo in your mind and then reproducing that image. And which is why the balance is always better. Like the framing is always better. <clears throat> One of the strengths and weaknesses of wedding filmmakers is we are constantly dealing with whatever we got. Whether you have a photographer yeah. that literally doesn't know what they're doing and is like making people pose these terrible poses, taking people to terrible light 
Like, how do you deal with that? Do you tell them to move? Do you tell, like, you can't just go, here's my shot. Like, that would be great yeah. if you could do that. But like, <clears throat> and I think one of the things photographers don't realize is how much control they have on the day and how little control everyone else has, <laughs> which is mm. cool. Cause I want to get into the next subject, which is like collaborating as a team. Yeah. Right. Because I think that's what it comes down to is like our approach bench as filmmakers. And this is not everyone's and this pisses people off, but I just tell them yeah. like, I don't care if you're mad about it. I like money. So like, yeah. like you can think what you want about this take, but it gets the result we want, which is photographers like working with us and the product's good and no one complains. So I don't know what the problem is, but we always <laughs> say, um, like just allow this photographer to set the tone and the pace. And if you need something, talk to them, but like, don't put that couple in the position of having to be like Solomon, mm. the baby being yeah. cut in half. <laughs> like, totally. Like, and so we always think it's better for everyone me financially the couple everyone involved the photographer too if we can figure out a way to collaborate right oh absolutely like because at the end of the day like i want whoever i'm working with i want every vendor to get the thing that they need because a like i'm just not a terrible human and then b yeah sure i also want referrals back from those people you know like we we work together jay you and i worked together at a wedding a year and a half ago something like that yeah and uh like now I haven't, I had another wedding on the East coast, you know, coming up this year. And so of course, like I was like, Oh cool. Like I know some guys that are really close. Of course I'm going to refer you because you were great to work with. Right. Yep. And like that, that really does matter is like that collaboration. And I do think regardless, like I've had plenty of <laughs> experiences on the other side where uh, video teams have come in and they've just wanted to run the whole day. And there's been seven of them and they've done the first look six times and <laughs> They're like interjecting in every moment possible. And I'm just like pulling my hair out going like no one is living one single authentic moment here because you're micro or you're producing every single thing that's happening. Yes. You know, so it's and, like I think that's there's a place for that, I guess. It's just I think it's also like pre communicating with the client of like, here's how I work. And so if you want somebody that I will work well with, regardless, you know, don't pair me with someone that's super overproduced. And if someone's really overproduced, don't, you know, pair them with someone's a little more documentary and a little more feel based and everything. Yeah. It's kind of a little bit backwards because when we work with someone like you, Benj, usually you'll be like, and I, I saw it in the footage that you, when you were working with Jason, you know, what do you need, Jay? You know, do you want to hop in and get it, you know, get this shot? And usually we're like, no, you just, did all the work and we got awesome stuff and we did our movement. We were able to get exactly what we wanted. Uh, but then yeah. you work with less experienced photographers that don't give you the stuff that you need to get because they're just like new at posing. They made them look really awkward and then they don't give you that space <laughs> to be able to work. Yeah, so yeah. You, you have to interject and be well, like, I need to get what I need to get now. Like I don't normally do this, but I have to do this this time. Can we it's just like, all acknowledge though that like there are people that just have no concept of the pacing or the, what the, what's going oh, on with the couples. Sure. Like, and I think, I think that's the hardest part about that a wedding. That is the hardest part when about When people the are wedding. first learning is the pacing of the day. That's the hardest part. It is yep. so crazy. And like, but like, it is one of the ways like you will, you will do better with your team, which, you know, to me, like my teammate on a wedding day is the photographer. Yeah. And they're oh, on sure. my team. Like, and you know, of course the planner to some degree and the DJ to some degree but mainly the the the, uh, the photographer and like when you're working with your team i can tell you this like in my experience working with photographers and i've done this for i think three photographers where i'm working with them and i'm like this person's struggling like <laughs> they don't understand the like they need help and i will go and bring them the people for all their photo sessions and i will manage that for them because i can yeah. tell that they're struggling with the pacing and i want them to succeed not just for them, but it helps me, it helps but me not you, be late yeah. for the reception, all that. And so it's like, I think people don't see the benefit. And so it's like, talk a little bit about binge, about like some of the um, benefits you've seen in like working collaboratively with other creatives, especially on a wedding day, but maybe in general. Yeah. Well, I mean, my thing is I tell clients and, and couples and 
um, planners and stuff like that, that the most creative thing that I do on a wedding day <laughs> isn't like my photography or whatever. That all stuff just happens for me. Like it's just kind of like autopilot. The most creative thing I do is problem solve whatever the hell is going to happen with like people being late or locations not working out or whatever the case may be is thinking creatively on ways to solve whatever issue is happening. And a lot of that comes with experience for sure. But, you know, I think everyone, if anybody's ever done anything at a wedding before, you know that it's probably not going to be perfect. And so I've done, I've had plenty of times where I've, you know, seen the catering staff struggling, kind of like you were saying with the photographer struggling, Jay. And like, I've gone back and been like, hey, it doesn't seem like you guys have enough staff. Like I'm going to run out and like help with the buffet line. And so there's been times where I've gone out and for 45 minutes I've served food because we needed to get through some of the food stuff to get to the next part of the event. And I'm going, if I can make this event go better, like that is the thing that needs to happen. I can't take any good photos while people are trying to eat. And if, you know, if I can help by literally just helping serve the food, like that is going to help the day because then the couple's going to be less stressed because mm -hmm. everything's going to be more on schedule. And then if they're less stressed, I'm going to get better and more like authentic photos out of them. I, mean, I guess I'm going to get authentic photos out of them either way, but I want, you want happy ones. I want authentic yeah. photos in a good mood, right? <laughs> um, and so that's that's how it works, you know. Like if I, the more that I can communicate with you guys or any other planner or any other vendor about, hey, what do you need? Like, how can I best make sure that we're both getting the thing that we need out of this? You know, that's going to help both of us tremendously in making sure that our relationship is good. I'm not stepping on toes as much and if i am like hopefully there's a relationship enough to go like hey man when you do this like i'm actually shooting this with a 16 or something and when you get in too close that's messing me up and you know then we can just be like kind of like collaborating on that stuff and then you know that helps me get the things i need that helps everything flow better usually that helps uh the timeline go faster because if i'm doing stuff that's screwing up the videographer then they're gonna have to redo whatever i'm doing and that's gonna take everything's gonna be twice as long you know, and so anything that I can do to just work better with everybody else is going to be a net positive for everyone. Everyone's going to have a better time working with me. The end result's probably going to be better. You know, everyone's going to be happier day of and afterwards. Uh, I think that we, because we are our own businesses and we are our own like silo, sometimes that part can kind of like show up on the wedding day and be less collaborative mm. and more like butting heads like we're almost competition. And then that obviously just screws up everything for everybody. I don't know if you know this, but most wedding videographers th probably view it that way. Well, and I'm not, actually, maybe not are most, you throwing your I'm, audience under the bus? No, uh, well, I, no, I'm trying to hold them accountable for their dumb viewpoints. If this is your viewpoint, it's a bad viewpoint. Like I want them to understand like none in no uncertain terms that that is not what I think. Like, and I think if you think that, that the photographer is the problem, probably you're the problem consistently, yeah. not in an individual wedding. Yeah. I've had plenty of bad interactions with other vendors and stuff like that as well. But then at the end of the day, I just went, okay, what did I not communicate well enough about what I needed or how their actions were affecting me or whatever, or how well did I not communicate to the client of like, hey, this is how I work. And I didn't communicate to you well enough how things need to be for me to be optimally working yeah um you know I, but I, I mean photographers do that too for sure and i think that it's one of those things where if you're going into a, a wedding or event or a shoot or anything like that and your end goal is for content for yourself or your portfolio like that's where you're gonna run into issues and be frustrated point. with things that's good because then you're going like i'm here to make portfolio for myself and then so then, you know, and you're not there for the experience of the couple or your end product for everybody. Like my my goal is the end product for every vendor there is going to be great. Right. And like, yes, I have to do my part to do photos. But like if I can work well with everybody else, then like everyone's things are going to be lifted. But if I'm going in there going like I need this to be portfolio worthy for me, I know people, you know, maybe they give a discount to do something or whatever. And so then their priorities day of are to get their thing. And I think that's where, especially when you're kind of more early on and you're at a cool event or something like that, you have this pressure to produce something that's going to do something for you instead of produce something that's going to do something for the other people there. And then that's where you start running into well, issues, you know? And Jared, I think, knows this more than most people because it's something he's really good at. <laughs> but, like, 
the relationship is the actual product that mm. will actually get you somewhere. Sure. The, the images, of course, matter, but especially for filmmakers, the images we we can't even get published. Like like for us, like <laughs> it's more important for us that a photographer, especially someone like you, who has a little bit of like status, who gets good weddings. Like if I can get on a wedding with a person like you, that's how I actually make my living. And I always try to explain this to people is like, you can make a hundred grand a year just off photographer referrals. And if you can swallow your pride, yeah, it's easy. <laughs> Just Easy. swallow your yeah, pride. I mean, that's who it is with anybody, like photographers and their ego with planners or anybody too. You sure, know? yeah. But that, that's the thing is like if you want longevity in this industry, and this is – you guys have been doing this for a while. Like I've been doing this for – this is year 14 for me. Mm -hmm. It's like if you care more about the people in front of you than the people that are on the internet that you are trying to impress, like – you know, then you're going to have a long career of doing good things and getting referrals and all that kind of stuff. You just have to think of it in the long term, not in the short term of every single shoot I have to do has to be this new amazing portfolio thing for me. And I'm going to burn bridges to get there. Yeah. Take us to church, man. It's good. <laughs> well, Come the, to the altar. Yeah. <laughs> the, the more that you do Repent it. Repent of your sins, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> the more you do this, the more you realize like that it actually you do you stop looking at every individual moment and you look at seasons and you look at like the macro yeah. of what you're doing as a as a creative and i think it's hard for people starting out to think it could ever be that way because you're like this is the yeah. wedding and when you have a season of 30 weddings you're like ah which wedding did i do and like you remember the people you met but all the work starts to blur together in a true and it's like you never could imagine you'd get there but i think just realizing like the person in front of you is the most important thing about that wedding. Um, Benj, what, what do you think, you know, cause I was surprised we were talking to a photographer about a year ago and they were saying how they actually prefer the videographer to have their own time, the photographer to have their own time and kind of split time 50, 50, um, which surprised me because, you know, I would think the photographer would want just as much time as possible. And if the videographer could kind of be off to the side and document, that would be ideal kind of for both parties. Um, what do you think of that kind of philosophy? Do you think it's right when a videographer is just doing a lot of documentation and essentially filming what the photographer is posing and what they're kind of directing in general? Hmm. Yeah, that's good. I mean, I think it just depends. Like the biggest part about that is this the time spent and so as long as like i know that beforehand that like let's say a, a videographer wants to do a lot of posing and wants their own time and everything like that like i'm fine with it as long as we budgeted that time into the schedule you know what happens that, that the frustrating thing for me is and i maybe it's probably the same for people that do or videographers and want that time as well is when one of us goes into that time thinking here's a X amount of time to do X amount of things. And then you show up and then you go, Oh, that's now cut in half because you're now splitting that time yes. between, you know, photo yeah. and video. I can't imagine that that's a practical approach for most weddings, by I, the way. I think so too. It doesn't it's not seem, practical. it doesn't seem very <laughs> reasonable. Yeah. It, yeah. Cause when I talk to brides, I'm usually like, look, like I do photography. So I understand kind of what the photographer is looking for. I've kind of, we've crafted our style of shooting video to, um, kind of complement the way that I like to shoot photos. So it works out. That's, I think, one of the reasons why we work really well with photographers, because essentially it's been like, where are the camera angles? Where do they all work? Where do I need to get my shots as a photographer? Um, but then also just in general, like um, our team really has a good idea of like what most photographers are, are, are going to want. But I think, um, yeah, when it, when it comes down to, um, yeah, posing people. And I usually tell the bride and groom, like photographer's director, they can run with whatever they want to do. We want to document. But I would recommend to videographers out there, if you do want your own time to A, tell your bride and groom, hey, I do a lot of posing, but then also connect with that photographer. Because a lot of times mm -hmm. the photographer is working with um, the couple on the schedule. Uh, so, oh, and tell the planner. And tell the planner, yeah, whoever's involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get involved really early because then you can get in front of it and it's not just a surprise to the photographer. That's a quick way to make enemies on, well, on the day of a wedding. And when we, when we, the biggest thing when we were like, let's do Huxley Film is like, we're, you know, we're still working on the product trying to figure out how to make it. But we quickly realized like, we need a private session with the bride and groom 
apart from the wedding day. Yeah. Like we need yeah. like something because so we're we only do mi minimum two day weddings for that product. Yeah. Because of that reason, technically, really, if we want to be doing three days. Yeah. Because we want to do a portrait session, then hang out, do recept, do the uh, rehearsal dinner the next day, mm -hmm. then document the wedding day. Like wedding filmmakers just need to realize, like for you to create a posed session with someone takes like twice as long as to create a great posed photo session. Like you, you can't be re expecting to have that time at every wedding. It's just not how weddings work. Yeah, I mean, unless you're unless you're budgeting it and talking about it beforehand and everything like that, you know, setting expectations is totally fine. And that, like, I think you kind of mentioned it earlier, like when I have set up a shot and I'm doing my stuff, I'm always going to check if I'm going to move anywhere else or move the couple or whatever. I'm always going to check with the video team and go, hey, like, do you guys want to do anything here? And if they want to do some sort of movement thing or gimbal shot or whatever, like, that's cool. Like, I'm fine. Uh, but it's like. The, it's the hard part when you're just like you're constantly like going in different directions um with all that stuff because that's what eats up the time and that's the thing is just, it's just the time that you're eating up you know i'm i'm not going to ever go into a, something thinking that the videographer unless i've worked for with them before and i know their style is only just gonna like shadow go off of whatever posing i do like i'm still gonna assume that they want to do something else because i'm not gonna i don't want to be their creative director you know what i mean so like I want to give them the opportunity to do whatever they want to do and fulfill their creative vision, right? Most weddings though, you're literally got 30 minutes with these people. Yeah. Like that's just realistic. If you're thinking you're going to if you're thinking like you better you better get awesome, you better book those hipster elopement weddings because the ones that will pay you consistently that will actually allow you to have, make a living being a wedding filmmaker, you're going to have to do a lot of 20 minutes like I don't really want to go out. Let's just go for a few. Like that is normal weddings and you're going to have to get good content no matter what the couple is willing to do. Cause ultimately it's not up to the photographer. It's not up to the planner. It's not up to me. Yeah. It's up to them. It's up to what they want to do. And I think a lot of people, they're really, they, they act like they have sour grapes with the videographer, but I'm like, look, you should have sour grapes with the couple because they're the ones who are unwilling to do an hour and a half long portrait session. <laughs> And it's like, and that's fine. Yeah. It's reasonable of them. That's not the whole, like not for a lot of people, that's not what they want to do on their wedding day. And I think just, uh, this is why the teamwork is so important because if you're looking and going, I got 30 minutes here. We only have 30 minutes. We only have 15 minutes of light where it's beautiful and then it's gone. Yeah. Like you can't be a, f you don't have time to be like, all right, can you just hold off a second? I'm going to, you know, like go back because I'm going to use my drone and like, <laughs> Yeah. You don't have time. And like that's okay. You're you're you you don't need to do that as a filmmaker. Like to make a great product that the couple is going to love. You will get some opportunities from time to time to find a couple. And so that's what I, I think you brought up a great point, which is if that's what you really want, and this is for photographers too. If you really yeah. want a couple's two hour portrait sessions, you're not gonna have many weddings that are willing to do that, but there might be some, and so you better find a way to get that out there into the universe, communicate that, so you can get that thing that you really want. My suggestion, though, is to create something people want to buy, like, and deal with the reality that people have 15, 30, 45 minutes to do this stuff. They don't have three hours at most yeah. weddings. I th and I, I think what happens, too, is the longer you do this, you know, you, you get into a rhythm of knowing what you need and what you don't need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that's where you can go. Oh, and I only have 10 minutes. Okay, cool. Like I'm completely comfortable with if, if we've made it to a location or whatever, getting everything that I need for an entire wedding out of a couple in 10 minutes, yeah. because you've done it like long enough that I know that like, yeah, sure. I could take 45 minutes and I could make cooler stuff, but I'm still confident in doing that in 10 minutes if I need to, you know, yep. like for whatever's going on in the wedding day and all that kind of stuff. Benj, I want to, kind of hop back because I found it really interesting that you I, I didn't realize that you shot your first or not first video wedding but you shot a video <laughs> wedding last year and, yeah. and I, I think this topic is really interesting because there are a lot of photographers who want to get into video um, and as a videographer and as someone who does both I know I can always tell a video shot by a photographer there's just certain things that immediately <laughs> stand out to me and I'm like so I, I guess I want to hop in and, and speak to the photographers out there who might be getting into video. 
Um, maybe get the, out of our room. Yeah, maybe the videographers here won't, won't <laughs> get enjoy off that. my lawn. Yeah. But, but honestly, I, I really do think that there's a lot more common ground between photo photographers and videographers. Jay and I, the, pretty much this show exists to introduce the world of videographers to the success that we've seen photographers have in that 95% of weddings get a photographer, 50% of weddings get a videographer. How can we bridge that a little bit? How can we get more people interested in videography? And I think just following the, the, the uh, tactics of just photography in the last 10, 15 years is, is the way to go. But going back to just what photographers can get from you know maybe more experienced filmmakers, um, are there certain things that stand out to you or that you saw that were a challenge besides the setting up, maybe talking more about like composition, about using, you know, a video camera in general that were, uh, that you found to be a challenge? Yeah. I mean, I, I'll say that I've definitely, like we talked a little bit about it earlier, but like, I'm just more of a nerd about that kind of stuff. So like, I already was like learning about shutter angles and ND filters and like that whole thing um and trying to figure out like the capabilities of my cameras and what you know profiles to shoot in and you know so like i think i'm a, probably a little bit further i mean i'm shooting this with like a giant like aperture like light dome in front of me and stuff you know so like i think i'd probably had a slight head start in in terms of that kind of thing totally but, um yeah i mean i i think a lot of it was just going being so used to things being like telling telling a story as a photographer it just feels so much i mean it is like so much more chopped up it's like here's a place and then here's like photo 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 next place photos of that photo 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 to transition to the next place like one scene setting photo but like connecting all those things together and telling a, a visual story that literally connected more like and was more fluid in that way that was like a harder part for me for sure um, yeah, I guess. So I mean, I, just just simply that, like trying to trying to transition my brain of like knowing how I tell a story through photos, and transitioning that to translate into video, like was more difficult I think than I was anticipating. Would you say? And I always think about this. Like, is there a future in the hybrid shooter? Like, is that going to become a thing? People who are doing both, people pulling stills from their video, people. Like, I wonder about that. I mean, I think that's where what everyone says the future is, right? As cameras, like, keep blowing up, we got all these 8K cameras that are shooting, like, you know, just insane. So, like, the resolution you're getting out of, you know, cinematic cameras, if you're not shooting 24P with, like, you know, motion blur, you know, then you can pull stills out of that kind of stuff, and they're super high quality, and, like, you can shoot raw video. So, like, I think that as things progress that is going to become maybe more of the norm you know and i know a lot of photographers have felt the pressure to learn that stuff especially as just even social media moves more and more into being more video based mm -hmm. you know a lot of photographers are trying to learn just, you know simple editing things to post on their instagram reels and tiktoks and all that garbage but i don't know i think i think there's still like we were kind of talking about like a still a big divide in between those mm -hmm. two realms for the vast majority of people like if you just like showed up to a, any random wedding that happens in america this year and you said hey you two like you photographer and you videographer you guys are switching today like i do not think that would go very well no you know? <laughs> like, although i think it would be would beneficial be, like... for for both parties at some point <laughs> To the yeah, like the I think side. that would just be a disaster of a train wreck. Oh. But like I think for the outside world, they go like, "Oh, you guys are using pretty much the same cameras yeah. and the same yeah. lenses and stuff." Yeah. Like, you understand things. Like you'd be fine. But there is a huge, I think, yeah, disconnect in between those two things. We we always talk about the uh, the drunk, you know, groomsmen at the at the uh, reception who are on the dance floor. Like, we'll be shooting video of them, and they're like, "Take a picture of us," and we're like, "Yeah." Jay always says he wants to make a hat that says it's video on it. So he yeah. just like turn it their way <laughs> every time. Um, but yeah, yeah. The best thing that I do with that, by the way, uh, for any photographers or video people that want to listen, uh, is the if you have a still photography, like a flash, uh, it has a test setting on it. So anytime that happens, we'll look at hey, you, take a big picture. I would just hit the test button because then it'll flash them in the face. 
and then they're like, cool, man, thanks. And then they leave, and then I don't have to actually look at that photo ever because it's not a photo. It's just them flash, getting flashed in the face. And they won't remember they said it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they're trashed. And yeah. so, I mean, sometimes I take it because it's funny, but, like, when the same guy comes up to you because he's trashed and, like, forgot that he's already asked for the same photo six times, then, yeah, you're going to get, like, just the, the test flash button dump on you. You know, I'm always curious about, like, I think we can make a co-pitch binge on this because I think this – why – I think every photographer should learn video, at least a little, at least enough yeah. to create their own promo reel, to create their own content. I think, like, I think it's valuable. <clears throat> I mean, am I crazy? Does that make sense? No, I mean – one of the things I did early on when I was first, I was thinking I was like five years into doing weddings and I realized that like all of my priorities at the time were spent learning how to be a photographer and like nothing was really spent learning how to just do weddings other than being at weddings. Right. And so I went, you know, I want the perspective of all these other people, like, because it's just, it's just completely different once you step into someone else's shoes. Right. You can have more like empathy and everything. And so, uh, I, I volunteered to be an officiant. So I've officiated weddings. I like MC to reception for somebody. Uh, I helped like sort of DJ or whatever, a wedding one time. You catered uh, a wedding one time. I, I have sort of <laughs> catered things because I, I have stepped into that role at times, but I have not actually catered, but I've helped with that kind of thing. Um, and then I used to have a studio space that was really, really cool and beautiful and everything like that. And so I hosted a few weddings there. I said, Hey, I heard you you need a, a wedding venue you can do it at my studio if you want for free and like i would just love the feeling of what a venue owner probably feels and then i realized like why those venue owners are grumpy because <laughs> people have terrible ideas and they rip things off your walls and like all sorts of stuff and i'm like okay now i know like that why they're so jaded towards people at weddings <laughs> yep. but, like having that perspective like when you decide to like step yourself and put yourself in other people's shoes and now that same thing, like once I did a, an elopement video, I was like, okay, cool. Like now when X, Y, Z is happening for a videographer, at least I go, okay, this is, this is not only I can conceptually understand what they're probably doing, but now I know how they feel when they're in that position to be behind on putting a microphone on or whatever the case may be, setting up their tripods for the ceremony when the ceremony needs to happen ASAP and you know, all that kind of stuff that you guys have to deal with on a regular basis. Um, I don't know. Just putting yourself in those situations is super helpful. I don't think many people do it, but yeah, yeah I'm, I, <laughs> I definitely think it's valuable for sure. That's awesome. Benj, um, I, I don't know if a lot of people watching know you, you've recently um, stepped into the role of kind of like YouTuber, right? And, and mm -hmm. a lot of what you do is review cameras and in your awesome studio space. It looks great, by the way. <laughs> I haven't seen the black setup. It looks awesome. Um, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. What, what I tried to match you guys today. You yeah. Know? Sweet. I like it. <laughs> what, uh, what creative box does that check for you? Yeah. I mean, so that's part of the reason I feel like, you know, I used to do stuff on, I used to make, you know, wakeboard videos and snowboard videos with my brothers when we were, you know, 15 years ago or whatever. And so I always sort of had, that's the, what got me into photography and, and that kind of thing was just shooting these videos of us doing sports and whatnot. And so I had that background and kind of knew a little bit about Final Cut back in the day. Um, but then I started a YouTube channel and was just like filming things on my phone and, and that whole thing. But then I just realized like, I could do this way better. I could make this look better. And it's, it's stuff that, you know, you think you know a lot about photography, but then you try to do the video part and you're like, okay, I actually do need a softbox and I do need to like boom a microphone right out of frame and like do all these things that you don't really think you need to do. And so, yeah, it's, it's definitely been like, um, I mean, obviously learning to do all that kind of stuff and, and reviewing cameras is, is fun, but also just learning that whole world. Yeah. I totally did that of, of sort of like scratching that creative itch for me. Um, and learning a completely separate set of things that is very connected to photography. And, you know, I'm looking at a camera that has all those same settings and frame rates and um, ISOs and everything. So the language is, is similar, but the practice of it is, is very different. And so it's, yeah, definitely expanding my brain into all those different realms, which is super, yeah, helpful. 
I, I saw you uh, posted your first YouTube short today. I was like, oh, Ben, just coming on. <laughs> oh, dude. T can you teach me and, and us about YouTube shorts and how that <laughs> What are they thinking? What is YouTube thinking? I, I just, it's, I everyone's like... trying to jump on that short form content, you know? Um, yeah, so I'm not doing YouTube shorts. So this is another thing. Like, I think I must have like a mental whatever, and I have to know about things. Like, I need to know why things are happening. Like, you know, photographers are all into like NFTs right now with uh, oh, yeah. cryptocurrency and all that stuff. And like, I need to know what NFTs are and why I need to sell one and everything. Um, but so like, if you are all in on YouTube shorts, basically it's, it's the whole idea of kind of competing with all these other short form content with TikTok and everything like that. So you have to do it less than a minute, right? It has to be less than a minute and then it's going to be vertical. So it's going to show up on what's called the shorts shelf. And uh, it's going to be within the YouTube app, basically. And then it's going to get downvoted and, uh, like crazy. <laughs> yeah. No, so, that's only. I mean, that's only. I guess us. I could. <laughs> I guess I could pull up my like stats. They're not that bad on the short I did, but the thing is that what they're recommending you do if you really want to get into it because they're still in beta technically, I yeah. guess. Yeah. Yeah. And so what they what they suggest doing is posting five shorts every day for a week or something like that and then posting every single day another short for a month or something wow. it's just like they want you to post <sighs> so much content to like get that thing rolling and then once it's out and it's full youtube starts really pushing it then your stuff will be suggested and whatever uh, okay but that is just like <laughs> it's no insane thanks what, what um but so... but the, the thing is like you can take the content you already have and the thing if, you, if anybody's like into youtube you know, it's a it's the second largest search engine in the world after Google, which yeah. owns it. Yeah. And so if you're not especially putting your video stuff to work in, you know, using searchable content, like making sure you're uploading stuff and tagging venues you want to work with and locations and all that kind of stuff. Um, it's just another super big SEO type of platform. And Google is obviously going to refer you to the videos about so you could have like bad SEO for your website and you could be on page 20. But if you have, you know, a video about whatever that thing is, YouTube might be pushing that stuff up with Google to be, you know, suggested right off the bat. So yeah. now I think yeah. the thing that we haven't found out and, and one of the reasons why it hasn't gone well for us so far is just we all of a sudden have this vertical video that's put on our <laughs> timeline, essentially, like in our <laughs> library. And so people yeah. are like, what the heck is this? I'm not why, you know, most of our viewers. Yeah. Are, are not used to that That's kind true. of content. You guys so have like, like the, the cinematic purists. Yeah. Oh, totally. totally. I got a, I got a bunch too of people saying like, what are you doing filming vertically? And I was like, <laughs> dude, it's just, it's just the you shorts thing. It is what you it is. To. Like the world. Sorry. It's... I will say this YouTube, you did a crap job rolling this out. You didn't explain it to anyone. And now we're all paying the price. <laughs> <laughs> it's, just, it's just happening. Yeah. And you have to go after it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, you, yeah. do you want to be a loser? Oh, well, you better get on this. You better create 17 more mediums. It's like pretty soon we're going to do Periscope again or something. Well, I think it's a lot of people, what they're doing is they're just reposting from TikTok. Like if yeah. you're a they're trying to get TikTok yeah. creators yes. onto YouTube, which is understandable. You know, you'll see a lot of people post and it has a little TikTok logo on, on the side. Uh, but the problem they're going to come across is like a lot of TikTok content is like music based. So it's like you bring it onto YouTube. They're not going to let you use that revenue. song. Yeah, so they're. I, I just wonder how they're going to roll that out. So Terrible. We'll see. Yeah. But, um. but also, we can't wait to post more shorts for you guys at Wedding Film School. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like it's terrible, but also this is where this platform is hosted right now. This yes. is going on YouTube. <laughs> yep, yep. Hey, man, thank you so much for coming and hanging out. And um, just really quick, give people one more. Like, where, where do they find you on social? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um yeah, I'm Ben Heish, so if I'm sure it'll be in somewhere that you can copy and paste it. Um, and that's on like, yeah, Facebook and YouTube, obviously, Instagram, uh, Clubhouse now. Uh, and then I, yeah, I have a Patreon. Uh, and then I sell presets and video lets actually as well. So very cool. Um, hey, I was gonna yeah. say this, Ben, too. You're um, pretty much a celebrity on Clubhouse, so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we do um we should do a companion clubhouse the week this gets released which i'm not sure when and i will ask you first but when you hear yep. this we're going to do a clubhouse and i'm thinking what if we did videography for photographers is our topic yeah i'm in 
Yeah. Let's so do it. so the week this podcast comes out, if you're listening to this that Thursday, probably, will yeah, some point sure. during the day, we'll do a uh, clubhouse and we'll just follow Wedding Film School show Instagram account or just follow us on YouTube and you can um we'll post the times on there and you can join us and of course binge will probably tell you hey i'm gonna go and do this but um yeah because i think it'd be a fun conversation to have like a bunch of photographers and a bunch of videographers in a room and then you can just ask yeah. questions about like how do i do video and what do i need to buy and you know because i know this is something that is interesting to photographers and i think it should be interesting to them as a business owner that they should not want to have to own this thing and not be able to use it fully yeah Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally game. I think it'd be super fun and interesting. Cool. Um, thank you for checking out the Wedding Film School show. As always, um, we forget to tell you to do this at the beginning. So if you made this, made it this far into our show, you've probably already done this. But like, subscribe, hit the alert bell, do all that stuff that YouTube um, demands that you do for us to be successful as Wedding Film School. Also, go check out um, Binge's YouTube channel because I don't think it's exclusively for photographers checking out cool, cool cameras. Um, all of us are, even if we're not for a living taking photos, we're all photographers. Everyone in America is a photographer and that's a great, awesome thing that we all now share. So if you're into that, go check out Binge's channel. Thank you so much for checking out the show. Have an awesome day.